Welcome to Insights, a concise comment from the Jubilee Center about current issues. Today we're talking to Nick Spencer, who authored, co-authored Christianity, Climate Change and Sustainable Living on behalf of the Jubilee Center, and is now Director of Studies at Theos. Nick, tell us what are we actually doing uh, that is warming up the world? Broadly speaking, there are three different things we do. The way we travel, the way we use energy at home, and the way we consume things. Now, there are lots of different ways that breaks down, but specifically in terms of the way we travel, it's the way we travel by car and the way we travel by plane. They are two of the most serious forms of transport when it comes to emitting carbon dioxide, which is the most serious greenhouse gas. When it comes to heating the home or using energy at home, it's specifically space heating or space cooling, air conditioning and water heating that between them use up something like 60 or 70 percent of domestic energy consumption. Thirdly, and probably most importantly, it's the way we consume things, how much we consume, and in particular, how far the stuff we consume has travelled to get into our homes. So, Nick, are you actually saying that we shouldn't travel, we shouldn't heat our homes, and we shouldn't consume anything? Surprisingly, I'm not. No, this is the problem that often attends the whole climate change debate. It seems to me that you know, people present the options as either living the comfortable life we do at the moment or returning to a kind of medieval hair shirt option where we enjoy none of the trappings of modern society. It does mean re-examining um, our lives, but it does so in a specific way. Interestingly, at least two of those things, the way we, tra the way we travel and the way we consume, are linked to what is commonly known as our well-being in society. So we travel further, which means we have a, a wider spread of a network of friends and family whom we see less often, and often our well-being suffers because of that, because it's people, it's relationships that are most intimately connected with our happiness. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with consumption, we get trapped on this hedonistic treadmill, we want more and more and more, and more doesn't mean better, more doesn't mean happier. So in actual fact, it's not just a simply of downsizing, scaling back and putting on the hair shirt, but of actually re-evaluating what is important to you and then changing your life accordingly. And Nick, are there any biblical examples of the way in which social or relational concerns and environmental concerns are integrated? Well, there are, and I think the best one is the example of the Jubilee legislation in Leviticus. Now, we're all very familiar with the Jubilee through the Jubilee Drop the Debt campaign, which has been very positive in many ways, but it's given the impression that the Jubilee was originally just about cancelling debt. And in actual fact, it was about more than that. It did quite a few things. Environmentally, it guaranteed rest for the land. It is an example of how, you know, in a sense, there was a, a, a creation ethic within the Torah. But it also had a social effect, which was to prevent long-term indebtedness and to keep social networks together. So in one single, quite simple piece of legislation, it brought together environmental and social concerns. And then finally, is there a single overarching message uh, that we can take away from Scripture about how to respond to climate change and create a more sustainable society? I think if there's any single message, it is that relationships matter. Relationships are a cause for joy. They are, the, they are effectively what makes us happy, and they are um, the key to biblical social teaching. And if we rediscover the value of those, then there are natural outworkings for how we respond to the problems of climate change and sustainable living. Nick Spencer, thank you very much. Thank you.